Welcome to Invisible, Breaking Through the Stigma of Addiction. I am your host, Dean Anderson, and I'm also an addiction counselor and an advocate for mental health and addiction. On our show today, our first guest is Sarah Montez. Sarah Montez is uh, the current manager of withdrawal management here in London, Ontario. Thanks for being on the show, Sarah. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, Dean. My pleasure. Uh, I'm I'm excited to hear what you have to say and the things that you can share with the community. I think that withdrawal management is something that uh, over the years has you know kind of been known as detox, and it's also um, I think it's kind of shrouded, and there's a little something there that we don't know about it, and there's only certain people that gain access to it or mm-hmm. are, are perceived to gain access to it. Can you just share a little bit about uh, what withdrawal management is and who you serve? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, So we are a non-medical facility and we have a team of trained addiction counselors and they work with individuals through the acute withdrawal stages as they navigate their addiction. Awesome. So everybody has access. Anybody can use the services? Absolutely. Anybody can use the services. We do. uh, There's some screening processes we go through both women and men and any individuals who uh, are non-binary can utilize our spaces. It's a safe place for everyone. Awesome. So, um, like I said earlier, there seems to be like there's this, this there's a stigma, there's an idea around a, a detox. Uh, what do you think are some of the things that prevent people from getting into withdrawal management or finding access to services? Excellent. I think that's a really great question. There's a lot of stigma. I would say in our society in general, there's a lot of ideas of who that person might be, a person who struggles with addictions and need support with withdrawal. Um, generally, there's this perception that it's only individuals who may be of a certain socioeconomic status or a certain um, housing environment or lack thereof. And so that couldn't be more wrong. I would say that addictions really can impact and affect anyone. And so in order to access our services, um, we are listed on, on um, the internet. There's obviously phone numbers in different ways for people to access us. Um, I would say that some of the struggle with that is, again, in systems and finding that information. Some individuals don't necessarily know where to go or where to look or who to ask. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting at home right now and I'm one of the viewers here and I'm sitting at home and I'm in suburbia and I want to pick up the phone and I want to call. What's that going to look like for me? What's involved in me gaining access to withdrawal management? Absolutely. So you would call our number that will be provided at the end of the show. And one of my trained staff would answer the phone. They would ask you questions about uh, what's your current situation? What are you looking for? Uh, In COVID, we would be asking you COVID symptoms and screening questions to ensure the safety of all of our current clients and staff. Uh, And then if there's beds available, they would talk you through what that would look like, uh, where you would go, what time you can come in. Uh, And then they would have a, a, a number of days stay in our observation area. And then once it's safe and they're ready, they would move over into our program area. At that point, there would be assessments and uh, a treatment plan initiated. Uh, Does the individual want to go to treatment beyond withdrawal management? Um, And various questions are asked and assessments at that point to determine that. So then you will help the people to get into the early stages of recovery and step through what that that looks like. And then the, the assessment process um, and future treatment, what, what, uh, what are some of the options for future treatment? Absolutely, great question. Um, so some individuals choose to, we do connect them to peer-led 12-step uh, programs. And so some individuals uh, make the decision to go back into community and engage in their recovery that way. We also, within the Center of Hope where we're housed, have a recovery community center. Individuals can apply and choose to go there where they navigate their recovery, their supports, their programs. There's residential treatment centers um, throughout Ontario. There's private counseling. Um, There's lots of options. Fantastic. So getting people situated in that direction. So uh, do you provide any services for the, the family members or connecting with people in that way? I would say that uh, it is limited at this point. I think we would provide um, information to, for example, something like Al-Anon or community uh, community programs. And I would say that that might be probably is a bit of a barrier um, when it comes to families supporting um, their loved ones who are struggling through working through um, addictions and recovery. 
Mm -hmm. Are there, um, so, and you're right. I, I, I see that. I recognize that. I recognize that there's limitations for family members and those things. And I, and I, and kind of asked you the question kind of, it was kind of a loaded question because I knew that there was, <laughs> I knew that there wasn't a lot, um, mostly because I want to draw attention to it, you know, for the general public to Excellent. realize that. Um, and I thank you for letting me put you under the gun like that. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, one of the other questions I had was, are there limitations? So when you said that there was a screening process for people to get in, what are some of the limitations? What would prevent somebody from being able to access withdrawal management? Well, I would say that if they're not in acute withdrawal, let's say they've already moved through that withdrawal process and they may be under the assumption that we are a treatment facility. Um, so they wouldn't require our services. We could potentially work with them, provide referrals and connections to other treatment centers. Mm -hmm. um, it could be um, safety concerns if, there, if there's um, concern of COVID, uh, if there has been previous behaviors where it puts others at jeopardy, we have to consider that. Makes sense. What about specific substances? Can I go there and withdraw off of uh, uh, my Tim Hortons that I have a minor addiction to? Well, I would say that's not definitely something that we specialize in. When it comes to substances, for an example, if somebody is um, wanting to withdraw from, say, alcohol, we would want to make sure that we have some medical support for that, mm -hmm. um, that there is a medical clearance that's necessary, or if an individual is expecting um, we would want medical clearance to be able to uh, to support them in those ways. Mm -hmm. uh, most other substances we can. It would be traditionally it would be uh, illegal substances or abuse prescription substances that we would be helping individuals mm -hmm. with. Okay. Um, so now, if you um, when you um, have somebody leaving there and they're 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 leaving the the, the system. Um, what are some of the barriers that they have when they're when they are going? You said that you try to provide this assessment and try to, to this. What are what are some of the things that people deal with when it comes time to discharge from withdrawal management? I would say one of the biggest barriers is that there's not enough residential treatment, and so uh, individuals are ready to go. They're ready to make those changes. They've worked through some some of the stages of change, and they're ready to engage in treatment. And unfortunately, there's just not enough space. And so we do provide referrals to community agencies. And, and like I said, the 12 step peer led type programs, um, that would be a huge barrier for individuals. They're ready to make those steps, but there's not a place to step quite yet. There's lots of wonderful agencies and services out there, but there's lots of need also. And so part of the process of discharging from our services uh, is that is referrals through the assessment, providing referrals to different treatment centers. Um, but that would be, the largest challenge. And, and second to that would be individuals who are wanting to withdraw from substances who are of no fixed address. And so uh, if they don't have housing and we want to refer them to a place that's safe, obviously we have our shelter systems and different things in place in the city of London, but that does make it a little bit more challenging when someone's trying to live in recovery. Sure, sure. Trying to be in uh, in housing and trying to maintain abstinence if that's what their choice is exactly. with other substance use and people around that are um, maybe even dealing or whatever that may be. Um, so one last question real quick, Sarah. What do you think it is that we need to do to break down some of the stigma that is around the idea of addiction as a whole, if you'd like, or around the, the detox? That's a really great question. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm glad you've asked. I think it is that individuals who are living in recovery need to live out loud. I, mm -hmm. think, I think we need to to destigmatize addiction. Like I said at the beginning, I think there's a certain type of person that our society believes is the addict or is that type of person. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that's true. Um, I believe uh, I'm a person in recovery. I know lots of people in recovery. And I think the more that we talk about it out loud, the more that we present our lives in such a way that that shows I can live a healthy life in recovery. I'm, I'm not that standard or that norm of that person. Uh, but I live in recovery, and I know there are hundreds and thousands of people like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think education, it starts at a really young age. Again, we stigmatize addictions and mental health. And so are we teaching young children um, that are we destigmatizing these things? Are we normalizing that these are struggles that human beings navigate? Mm -hmm. So the more the more that we 
uh, shelter it and change the idea that you know it's not something that should be talked about the more we reinforce the idea that it's shameful and that there's something that we we should or shouldn't be doing in regards to that process so i'm behind you 100 percent on that and so that's why we're here today to talk about it i just uh, i appreciate you putting that out there and thank you so much for being on the show today and um I uh, look forward to working with you in the future in the City of London and the work that you do. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you for having me here today. It was a wonderful experience. Awesome. Thanks. Our next guest is an MD and is an addiction doctor, and he's such a busy guy, we even have to talk to him in his office. <laughs> Dr. Doctor Ken Lee is on the, on the show. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Thanks, Dean. Nice. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Oh, I, I so appreciate it. I, I've had the pleasure of being in your presence and seeing some of the work that you do, and it's, uh, it's really important stuff. And I would love to talk more about some of the advances that you've seen over the last you know, four or five years in addiction medicine. Can you share some of that stuff with us? Yeah, there's been some uh, major advances in, in addiction medicine these days. Um, the most notable right now is with regards to uh, opiates. Um, as you know, there's a big fentanyl problem out there now. And, you know, in the old days, we had methadone. And then in the more recent days, we had Suboxone. But now we have uh, monthly injectable Suboxone and six-month implantable Suboxone. Um, two different products used in different situations, but um, it's been a major advance in, in uh, addressing opiate abuse, particularly with the fentanyl issue we have now. Mm. Um, so we're very gratified to see it. Um, we've been using... Um, Subocade, which is the injectable form, for about maybe a year and a half now. We did get uh, early access to it from Health Canada and trialed it here in London at the RAM Clinic. One of the first places to do, uh, to use uh, Subocade um, was here in London. And we had a, a small study with 12 patients here in London. And then Vancouver uh, had four patients, so a total of 16 patients. And we've had tremendous success with it. So today we have 85 patients uh, being treated with Supplicate. So what is the, the major benefits to going from something like Supplicate opposed to Suboxone or Methadone? The biggest issue with uh, Methadone and Suboxone has always been the daily dosing. The requirement for daily dosing and, and the regulations um, initially require daily observed dosing at the pharmacy. Um, less so with uh, Suboxone because it is a little bit safer. Um, but we're, we're now we're able to convert people uh, after starting people on Suboxone for a week to the uh, monthly injection. And so this gets rid of all the issues with regards to uh, uh, missing work to go to uh, the pharmacy, pharmacies closed, uh, inconvenient schedules, et cetera. But the major advance is that there's no issue with forgetting to take your medication daily. Mm. So it's hard to forget to take a medication when it's given to you once a month at the, at the clinic. Absolutely. It sounds like a lot of benefits in that way. And there's also um, some of the parts of going to um, pick up your medicine every day that I'm sure that must remind people of their addiction every day. So there's a part that, you know, instills some of that stigma and some of that um, yeah. shame and being and having to go and get their, their, their daily dosage of, of medicine. So with people being able to go to work, are you seeing a, a different demographic? Like who is Who's the, the, the demograph that you treat? Who are the, 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 who are the people that you help? We see people from all walks of life at the Ram Clinic. So we see people who have jobs, have very good jobs. We have people that have no jobs or are marginally employed. So addictions can strike any demographic. Um, and having a, the option of a once a, once a month injection um, helps people no matter what the demographic. We describe that as breaking the pill to mouth cycle. So the pill to mouth cycle is a daily reminder that, oh, if I don't take my medication, um, I still have this issue, I still have this problem. Mm -hmm. And you know, some days you may not be motivated to take your medication. Well, this takes it out of your hands. It gets rid of that uh, impulsivity to not take your medication. But the real beauty is that patients actually feel better on a steady dose of uh, Suboxone as opposed to the ups and downs of daily dosing. Um, so people, when they wake up in the morning, tell me that they feel normal. And that's very different than in the old days when you were taking methadone and you would feel some withdrawal symptoms in the morning, can't wait to take your methadone, 
oh my God, I have to go to the pharmacy to get my methadone. Um, if I have a carry, then I have to take my methadone at home. I, I could forget it. Um, but then there was always that up and down in symptoms, withdrawal symptoms, cravings, whereas with the uh, smooth levels that you achieve with a once a month injection, all that is out of the picture. And it lets you concentrate on your, on your rehab. It, it lets you concentrate on dealing with some of the underlying issues, um, things that got you to the addiction. So it's uh, fantastic. Absolutely, yeah. So when we're talking about, um, usually there's some sort of coping or emotional uh, mechanisms that are needed as part of the addiction. That's part of why we get hooked on the drugs. But what you're talking about is there's a little more emotional stability when you can just stay on a certain dosage for a while of time and then still be able to work on yourself or go to work and focus on these other things. That's um, that's definitely a, a impactful uh, for sure. How does somebody go about getting getting a, uh, on something like that or, or uh, getting a, a prescription, so to speak, for uh, supplicate? You do have to do some research into where you're going to go. Um, we obviously at the RAM clinic um, use uh, some of the newer advances, um, but other clinics may not be uh, on the cutting edge of uh, these new advances. Mm -hmm. um, so you do have to do your research. And basically, to go on the uh, once a month injection, you have to be uh, stabilized on Suboxone, started on Suboxone in the usual manner that Suboxone is started. And there are nuances in how that's done, but the uh, doctor in the clinic would, would work on that with you. Um, in the old days, um, in the old days, I'm talking about just two years ago, <laughs> <laughs> you would have to present in a state of withdrawal before starting on Suboxone. Um, newer protocols and techniques do not require that. And uh, we have been working on that for a couple of years now. And we, we think we have a protocol developed and a technique developed that people don't have to present in withdrawal to start on Suboxone. Methadone is a little bit different. Uh, methadone, um, you don't have to be in withdrawal to start methadone. But at the same time, it takes about three to four weeks before you can get to a stable dose of methadone. Suboxone and a stable dose can be achieved within probably about uh, two days. Wow. Um, and with the new microdosing techniques um, that don't require withdrawal, we could probably stabilize a patient in about uh, seven days. And then after you've been on a stable dose of Suboxone, then you can convert to uh, the, the once a month injection. I should mention a little bit about the uh, six month implant. Um, that's more for people who have been on Suboxone for a number of uh, months and are ready to taper down. Um, Sublocate injection is only used in patients who are between 8 and 24 milligrams of Suboxone versus the probufene implant is for patients on 8 milligrams or less. So as you can see, the probufene implant system is more for people who are just about finished um, their Suboxone treatment. That's, uh, that's fantastic. So um, when you said earlier, you said we've developed. So um, I, my understanding is, is that you're a, a forerunner. You're a, a, a trailblazer in this whole process. Uh, can you tell me more about what you had to go through and the things that you've done to, to do that? Well, you're very generous, Dean. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think it's true. So, so what actually happened, it's very interesting. Um, I heard of uh, this method called the Bernese method. Um, for microdosing patients on the Suboxone. It was intriguing. And when I looked at it, um, it was in Bern, Switzerland, where Einstein is from. Uh -huh. um, there was this doctor uh, in a clinic, in a very small clinic in Bern, Switzerland, that was doing this novel technique. Um, so I read, in, on, read up on his uh, technique and then well, you know, I always need a trip to travel, a reason to travel, right? <laughs> so I actually took a road trip to Bern, Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> a road trip. Spend some time at his clinic um, to learn about his uh, Bernese method technique. Wow. And I had been trying it on my own before visiting uh, Dr. Hamig, uh, but I went to Bern, Switzerland. And, uh, you know, Switzerland is a fantastic place to visit, I'm going to tell you that. I bet. Um, and we saw all the different uh, things they do in this clinic, including heroin replacement, methadone. Um, they have different types of methadone in Switzerland that don't have the side effects that we have. Yeah. Um, and they have Suboxone, um, Sublocate and Probufi. They have all that, right? Um, so I learned uh, more about his technique. I showed him what we were doing here in London. And then he, and then he told me, Ken, you've done more of this than I have. 
Um, so we uh, developed and perfected the technique, and we have it all written up in a protocol, and we distribute it across Canada. And interestingly, um, uh, Australia um, picked up on this, and uh, I've spoken in Australia by video, unfortunately. I would have preferred to go to Australia, but uh, they've picked up on our, our technique as well. Wow. That's fantastic. So uh, London is uh, is a an open market for this type of treatment and we're we're setting some standards and showing people that things can be different can you uh, tell me a little bit more about how this is impacting uh, overdose because right now we know that there's an overdose crisis we've been talking a lot about it seeing a lot of it in the media when it comes to uh, fentanyl and carfentanil and those scary drugs that are out there can you share a little bit about that yeah it's uh, very scary out there right now the fentanyl that you're seeing on the street is not only fentanyl um, the Toronto Drug Checking Service has detected other substances, including xylazine, which is a veterinary uh, sedative. Um, they've detected etizolam, which is a high potency uh, synthetic uh, benzodiazepine. And a lot of the overdoses from fentanyl may be related to those other substances and not just the fentanyl. Um, we were hearing of cases of fentanyl overdoses, so-called fentanyl overdoses that were not responding to naloxone, the reverser, the reversal uh, nasal spray, and it turns out that maybe those overdoses were due to other substances. Um, in our collection, in our data here in London, um, of the 85, now 86 patients on Sublocade here in London, started a new one today, um, there have been zero fentanyl overdoses. And the interesting thing about uh, Sublocade is that it actually blocks out the opiate euphoria that people get from using fentanyl. And by reason, if you can't get a high, you can't get overdose. Yep. So, yep. so the saying is, no high, no die. Um, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's our data, and uh, that data will be coming out at an international conference in June. Um, as opposed to patients on uh, oral methadone, and you know patients overdose on um, fentanyl when on, well on methadone, and, and certainly on Suboxone you can overdose as well. Although 16 milligrams of Suboxone should block out fentanyl, it doesn't block it out if you're not taking it. True, 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 true. So it's a lifesaver. It's a lifesaver outright. Uh, so if I wanted to get uh, on uh, Sublocate or Suboxone or any of these uh, opi opioid antagonist uh, treatments, uh, what uh, is there a cost involved or how would I do that? Generally, um, it's covered on the Provincial Ontario Drug Benefits Plan, if you're uh, covered under that. So that's under 25, you're fully covered. Yep. If you're on social assistance, it's fully covered. Um, Supplicade and Probufin, both of these products, are covered with uh, private drug plans. So Green Shield, Sun Life, uh, Manulife, et cetera, um, they're all covered. Yep. Um, it's covered under uh, the uh, NIHB, which is the health plan for... Uh, um, aboriginal populations. Um, so that there is a small group of people that is not covered for, but uh, for the most part, I think 90% plus it's uh, covered. It is expensive. You do have to pay for it. It does cost $600 a month. Uh, if you have no coverage at all. Wow. Yeah, that uh, that could be uh, that can definitely be a barrier. I could see where that would, would, would be a barrier. Um, what I, I, I don't think people realize is that we assume that somebody's on Suboxone or Methadone that it's uh, it's a it's a street uh, person, the person uh, who's using heroin in the street or fentanyl, um, and a lot of the times, in, in my experience and my my work that I've done, I've seen a lot of it has to do with people that have been given prescriptions for pain medicine. They've been given you know opioids as a, a just a, a pain relief or part of surgery or something like that, right? So having those people, you know, knowing. Part of the reason why I want, want you to be on the show is so that we can get this out to the general public to say there's more, there's something different. It's not the same thing. Um, if you were to give anybody advice who is sitting at home right now and was struggling with some sort of opioid addiction or substance use disorder, what advice would you give them, Ken? Well, we have hope now. We have an answer. Um, I wouldn't call it necessarily a cure. <laughs> um, but it does uh, provide a lot of hope these days with the uh, new advances in uh, opioid use uh, disorder, fentanyl addiction in particular. And, and just to further your point, um, no matter how you source your opiates, whether it's by a doctor's prescription, whether you're buying it from a friend, you're buying it on the street, it's still an opiate. And no matter what your social demographic uh, 
level is, so to speak. Um, we're all biological creatures and we can all become addicted for various reasons, right? It doesn't matter what you look like or what you do. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Ken. I appreciate you being on the show and all your knowledge. And uh, I'm going to be tapping into that again and emailing you and calling you and asking you for <laughs> advice. Um, uh, I appreciate you being on the show. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. So thankful to have Dr. Ken Lee and Sarah Montez on the show today. They both have distinct avenues of care and the services that they provide. Withdrawal management is abstinence-based. People go there and they look for help withdrawing from, or some people call cold turkey, from their drug of choice and then work their way into recovery. Whereas with Dr. Ken Lee's approach, they use medicines and addiction medicine to help people overcome the pain and the discomfort that goes along with withdrawal or the symptoms and byproducts of having substance use and addiction issues. One is harm reduction and one is abstinence. Some people believe that these two things shouldn't live in the same world and they can't be any further from the truth. The reality is, is we meet people where they're at and help them with the things that they need to find the care and to find the recovery that they want. And both of these people every day are saving countless lives in the city of London and helping people find what they need to find recovery and to live a happy lifestyle. Abstinence is actually on the spectrum of harm reduction. Sometimes harm reduction is what's needed in order for somebody to even find abstinence or to see that there's a possibility of care in their future. So they both have the same goal. They both do wonderful work. And I'm so glad that they were here today. So uh, on the website, deananderson.ca slash invisible, you'll be able to find links to both of these people's wonderful services and the things that they do in the city. And remember, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is now.